George Kroll was born April 17, 1933 in Hindenburg, Upper Silesia during the Nazi Germany era. He was the youngest of eight children. Joachim's father was a miner who became a soldier for Germany. He was taken as a prisoner of war by the Russian army during World War II. This was sad and embarrassing for the family. It is believed that his father died during the war. His family suffered from poverty and hunger. They moved to a two-room home after his father's presumed death. Joachim was seen as weak by his family. He was also a bedwetter. This was humiliating for him. And it didn't help that he was thought to be a weak child by the people in his community. He had a poor education and only reached grade three. He quit school in 1948 at the age of 15 after having repeated several grades more than once. There are some reports that he didn't know how to read. Later on in life, psychiatrists found that he had an IQ of 76, which makes him intellectually disabled. He was said to have sexually abused animals. After he left school, he worked as a farmhand. While working as a farmhand, he helped kill farm animals. He said that helping kill these animals inspired his murderous fantasies. Seeing a pig being slaughtered awakened his sex drive. At the end of World War II, Joachim's family moved to North Rhine, Westphalia. He was a part of the Salad Generation. Many young adults during the McCarthy era felt that it was dangerous to speak out. They were too young to see action in World War II and too old to participate in the fun of summer love. Joachim was an awkward person who felt sexually inadequate around women his own age. He was so awkward that he could not have actual conversations with females. When he did attempt to have a relationship with a woman, he said he felt awkward and inadequate with women sexually, describing his only sexual encounter with a woman as a failure. In his warped mind, he concluded that he should only have encounters with someone who could not complain about his performance. His mother died in 1955. He and his siblings went their separate ways and lost touch. In 1957, he moved to Duisburg, a heavy industrial city in the midst of the Ruhrpott. Ruhrpott was an industrial area. He made this area his hunting grounds for the next 20 years. Around 1960, he began working as a laboratory assistant. Afterwards, he worked for Tyson Industries and went to LAR. He moved around a lot. Wherever he ended up, he was seen as non-threatening. The local children called him Uncle Joachim because of the toys and candy he kept in his teeny flat. Ignoring the rules of the building, he invited the children in his home, believing they were his friends. He especially enjoyed the attention he received from the young girls. He went on walks with the little girls. The girls never knew about the inflatable dolls in his home. Though he had limited intellectual capacity, he managed to keep that from the kids. To satisfy his sexual urges, he used an inflatable doll as practice for strangling. He filled his bachelor pad up with electronic gadgets and the dolls, frequently strangling the dolls with one hand and masturbating with the other. For years, Joachim lived in Friesenstrasse, showering children with treats and gifts. He kept dolls that were the size of small children in his apartment for the girls to play with. Parents in the community remembered Joachim as very kind and seeming to want a family for himself. Little did they know that his friendly, jolly, harmless manner was just a facade. The behavior he displayed publicly was in sharp contrast to who he actually was as a person. Three weeks after his mother died in January 1955, he committed his first murder. He suffered some sort of psychotic episode that attracted him to commit the crime. He lured an attractive and charismatic 19-year-old Irum guard, Strail, to a barn near the village of Valsdetta. 
with the promise of a gift. He strangled her and slashed open her abdomen, disemboweling her. He desired her sexually, but knew that he could not have sex with her while she was alive and fighting. Her body was found five days after she was killed on February 8, 1955. Joachim claimed after his first murder, his murderous tendencies subsided until four years later. But authorities believe he was responsible for other murders between 1955 and 1959. In 1956, 12-year-old Erica Schulet was raped and strangled in Kirschellen. At this point, other men were being blamed for the killings. Innocent men were actually found guilty of Joachim's murders more than once. On June 16, 1959, 24-year-old Chlora Frida Tesimer was murdered in the meadows near Rheinhausen. He slashed the flesh of her buttocks and thighs wrapped them up and took them home to cook for dinner. The authorities arrested a local mechanic named Heinrich Arts for the murder. Feeling hopeless because he was wrongly accused and unable to clear his name, Heinrich hung himself in jail. On July 26, 1959, 16-year-old Manuela Note was found after being raped and strangled in the city park of Essen. Some of her flesh had been carved from her buttocks and thighs. The way that the slices of flesh were removed from the victims' bodies indicated that the murderer intended to eat parts of the remains. The police named the killer the Ruhr Hunter. On April 23, 1962, 13-year-old Peter Gansa was found, raped and strangled in Dinslaken, Bruckhausen. Her left forearm, hand, and both buttocks were sliced off. Another innocent man, Vincent Kuhn, was arrested and convicted for her murder. It was plausible that 52-year-old Kuhn had murdered Peter because Kuhn, who worked as a miner, had a vehicle called a Gogo Ezar, which was a cross between an automobile and motorcycle that matched the description of a vehicle a farmer had seen near where the body was found the day of the murder. Police checked motor vehicle records and discovered that 522 of these vehicles were owned in the area. Of said number, all the vehicle owners had alibis that were verified, all except for Kuhn. On top of that, Kuhn had a criminal record, one that made him the prime suspect for the crime of which he was accused. He had been convicted of child molestation. Kuhn gained access to little girls at parks and other places where he lured his victims to him with candy or money. He coerced them into removing their clothes and allowing him to give them lessons on masturbation. He masturbated as well. Not many girls came forward to accuse Kuhn of inappropriate acts with them, but police always suspected that the number was far greater than what they knew. Even though what he'd done to the little girls was unforgivable, the police were not entirely convinced that he'd kill Peter because Kuhn never approached teenagers. They did not dismiss the fact that he owned a go-go, the, the witness testified to seeing, and Kuhn did not have an alibi for the time of the murder. Medical experts were called in for their opinions, and they determined that any man who could commit the crimes that he committed against little girls could potentially get carried away and end up a rapist and murderer. Their theory was that he lost control of himself, raped Peter, and after realizing what he'd done, tried to cover it up by murdering and mutilating her to make it look like it was an act committed by a sadistic sex murderer. Somehow, the official post-mortem report that showed that Peter had been murdered first and then raped was ignored, and Kuhn was charged with rape, murder, and mutilation of Peter Gonzo. There was no evidence linking him to the crime, but the jury found him guilty anyway. He was sentenced to 12 years along with psychiatric treatments to rid him of his unnatural entrance in little girls and convert him into a useful member of society. He was released from prison six years later. During that time he was incarcerated, authorities believed that Kuhn would have been blamed for another rape and murder of another of Joachim's victims. June 4, 1962, 12-year-old Monica Taffel was found in Velsum. She disappeared on her way to school. 
Slices of flesh from her buttocks, thighs, and forearms were removed to make a steak. Searchers found her body in a rye field nearby. Perhaps if the police had noticed the similarities between Monica and Peter's thefts, Coon could have been spared six years in jail, but that didn't happen. Instead, another innocent man, 34-year-old steel worker Walter Quicker, was arrested. He was known for having an interest in little girls. Quicker became a suspect after a witness came forward and said they'd seen him in the company of a young girl on the day of Monica's murder. He denied the allegations, saying that he was fond of young girls because he always wanted a daughter, but he and his wife were unable to have one. Therefore, he lavished attentions on little girls. Consequently, the authorities questioned dozens of young girls in Felsom, and all denied that Quicker had ever behaved inappropriately with them. None of them had a bad word to say about him. He served a short sentence before he was released. What was already an awful situation for him to concern for the worse. The townspeople did not think the authorities did their job by punishing him, so they took matters in their own hands. They jeered and spat at him on the street. Shopkeepers wouldn't serve him. Young people would even run up behind him and ask how many girls he'd raped that day as the town's older citizens would howl with laughter. His wife divorced him in shame of being married to who some considered to be a child molester. It was all too much for Quicker to bear. So on October 5, 1962, five months after the murder of Monica, Quicker took his final walk into the forest with a clothesline and hung himself near the same spot Monica was found. This caused the police and townspeople to believe they'd been correct in assuming he was guilty. They would later find out that wasn't the end. Joachim was free and roaming the streets and he was still shattering lives. Sometimes Joachim would switch up his patterns in an effort to confuse police. No meat was taken from the victim of his next murder. On September 3rd, 1962, 12-year-old Barbara Bruda was abducted. She was never found. August 22nd, 1965, Joachim traveled to Grossenbaum where he spied 25-year-old Hermann Smits and his fiancée Marion Veen in a lover's lane by a lake having sex in the front of a car. Unlike his usual method of luring lone girls to him for murder, Joachim came up with a plan to lure the young man to him. Joachim slashed the tire of the car in hopes that the young man would get out to inspect the noise. Once Harriman got out the car, Joachim stabbed him repeatedly and planned on killing and raping his fiance, Marion, next. In an unexpected turn of events, Marion leaped into the driver's seat of the car and drove directly at Joachim. He dodged the vehicle and ran away. Though she got a good look at Joachim, Morion's account of him didn't turn up any leads. September 13, 1966, 20-year-old Uzala Rowling was found in some bushes after being strangled in Forrester Bush Park near Marl. She had been dead for almost two days, stripped from the waist down and provocatively posed. She had been visiting with her boyfriend, Adolf Schickel, and he became a suspect for her murder. He was so upset that he threw himself in the main river. December 22, 1966, five-year-old Ilona Harker was found in a ditch in Ruppertal. Joachim abducted her and took her on a train to Ruppertal, and then he took her by bus to Rimshide, or hookah's wagon. He walked her through dense bush and woods in the fade battle and raped her in a ditch and watched her drown. Morion Veen was not the only potential victim to escape Joachim's, Joachim's clutches. A girl much younger got away from him as well. There are several different versions of what happened that fateful day. One is that June 26, 1967, Joachim lured 10-year-old Gabrielle Putman into a court cornfield and showed her pornographic pictures. She fainted. He took that moment to take advantage and attempt to rape her. The sirens of a nearby coal mine rang out and the area became swarmed with miners on their way home. Joachim slipped away unnoticed and Gabrielle survived. 
Another account of events is that Joachim knew Gabrielle. She lived in Grafenhausen and he lived nearby in Grafenwald. Gabrielle knew him as Uncle Joachim. The townsfolk saw him as harmless. He took little girls on walks and they had no reason to believe the walks were less than innocent. He always brought the girls home safely, usually stuffed with candy or ice cream. In the past, Joachim practiced restraint in who he preyed upon and when. He was aware that if a family had allowed their daughter to go on a walk with him, he would be the number one suspect if something happened to their child. This excursion was different. As he ambled along with the 10-year-old innocent along the road leading from Graffin House into Graffin Vows, he noticed no one was around. He then took Gabrielle by the hand and led her to a nearby field of wheat, telling her he had something to show her. Once they were hidden from the road, he sprang into action, showing Gabrielle a collection of pornographic cartoon booklets. Gabrielle was confused at first, but she slowly began to realize what the cartoons were doing and became embarrassed. She covered her eyes with her hands. Joachim touched her shoulder. She was not afraid that he would hurt her and was not aware that she may be in danger, but she ran away from him. He knew where he was and did not give chase. She did not stop running until she arrived home. She never went near Uncle Joachim again, and she never told anyone what happened until years later after he'd been exposed as a murderer. Joachim's next victim would not be so fortunate as to survive an encounter with him. July 12, 1969, 61-year-old Maria Hetkin was found after she had been raped and strangled at Hukenswagen. Joachim had broken to her home and raped her corpse in the front hall. She was a plump woman, but Joachim did not take any of her flesh to eat later on. May 21, 1970, 13-year-old Yuda Ron was found strangled after walking home from school. She'd walked a short stretch through the woods between the Hossel railway station and her home. Peter Shea was arrested and later released for her murder. He confessed to the crime after being hounded by his neighbors in 1976. May 8, 1976, 10-year-old Karen Topfar was found after being raped and strangled in Ferda. July 3, 1976, the body parts of four-year-old Marion Catter were in the process of being simmered when Joaquin was arrested. Young Marion had been reported missing from a nearby playground. So police went door to door, canvassing the neighborhood, trying to find information. Joachim's neighbor told the police about a strange encounter he had with him. He told the police that the waste pipe in their building had been blocked up and he asked Joachim if he knew what had been backing up the pipe. Joachim had told him that the upstairs toilet in their unit was clogged with guts. A plumber quickly verified this witness statement fleshing the child's lungs, liver, kidneys, and heart out of the pipe. Police went over to investigate and found Joachim in the middle of cooking the four-year-old body of Marion Ketter. Her body was cut up. They found some parts of human flesh in a plastic bag in the freezer. A small hand was cooking in a pan of boiling water with carrots and potatoes on the stove, and the entrails were found stuck in the waste pipe. Joaquin was very particular about the locations where he killed, only killing in the same place a few times years apart. This degree of planning was part of the reason it was believed that his IQ was higher than 76. He had a self-awareness and methodical ways of choosing victims that a person who was mentally deficient would not have had the mental capacity to carry out. It had been so hard to catch Joachim because other killers in West Germany had the police distracted. Werner Boost had been killing couples in the area a few years before Joachim committed his first murder. Other killers threw the police off Joachim's scent as well. Joachim ate the flesh of his victims because according to him, meat was expensive. He was trying to save money on grocery bills. He tried human flesh on a whim and decided he liked it. He chose his victims based on whether they looked tasty. He couldn't keep an erection with the woman while she was conscious. 
When the act was done, he would go home still aroused and have sex with and masturbate over his sex dolls, strangling it, reenacting the crimes. It was easy for Joaquin to get away with his crimes because of his nomadic nature. He frequently moved around from town to town. He couldn't be sure exactly how many people he killed because he was intellectually disabled. The number could have been smaller or larger. He didn't know any of his victims' names, but he could remember the time and place he'd killed them. The times he was shown pictures of a girl, he will remember her. A lot of times when the police were taking him to the scene of one of his crimes, they would pass an area where Joaquin would stop and tell them that he killed someone in that spot. The police would check their files of unsolved murders, and it would check out. When the 43-year-old was arrested, he readily confessed to murdering Marion Kettner, but while comfortable in his cell, he confessed to murdering several other victims. He admitted to what he called a severe mental illness of needing to commit cannibalism and ask for a cure. He was sure that he would be given an operation and that would be the end of his homicidal urges. He had no remorse or regretful feelings, and he was not insane. He was known as a sufferer of psychopathic thinking, and psychiatrists found him to be sexually sadistic. He was arrested July 3rd, 1976, but didn't stand trial until 1982. He admitted to murdering one man, 13 women and girls, and one attempted murder. He was only convicted of nine murders because the statute of limitations had run out for some of the murders. He was sentenced to life in prison. This shocked him because he thought once he was caught, the authorities would get him the help he needed to stop killing. He was under the assumption that after he was given treatment for his murderous impulses, he would be released back into society as a reformed man. This was not to be. At the age of 58, Joaquin Kroll died of a heart attack in prison on July 1st, 1991. He would never be rehabilitated or cured of his sickness. Some of the details in this case are alleged. Thanks for watching.